cremation would be $1,125. That would be with the GST. The time has come for you to choose your side. And you've only got so long to learn how to field strip an AK because Satan isn't going to give you that chance. You're a target all the time. Police are targets, but they got guns. Cabbies are targets, and they got nothing. Here we are in Halifax, site of the 95 G7 Economic Summit, a meeting place for seven of the world's most powerful leaders to negotiate for three days. So what was the big news? Stabilization of world currency markets, the USA and Japan trade war, Bosnia? No. What was really on everyone's mind was who's who and what in the hell were they wearing? As observers or spectators, what we're all looking at is who looks the best, who is most impressive as a leader, who has made the most impact on the media, and without a doubt, it's the leaders that are uh, much better groomed and um, much better dressed. Chancellor Cole was the largest guy and wore a really, really big suit. I think everybody was afraid of him, and I think a lot of people, when they'd see him coming towards them, their reaction was to go, ugh. Here comes a really big guy, and he sort of looked like the friendly giant. Uh, Mariama, he, um, well, was the smallest of all the leaders attending the G7, and he, uh, without a doubt, had the largest eyebrows. Whenever I see any eyebrows that big, I automatically think waxing or electrolysis is an option. Why someone wouldn't take the initiative to suggest to him that, um, Something could be done about that little problem. The sexiest leader, I would have to say, was Chirac. The only man featured during the entire event to wear a very nicely tailored double-breasted suit. I guess it makes perfect sense that the Prime Minister of France would have those resources available to him and definitely come out looking the best. Clinton always looked really clean, very well-groomed. Um, he definitely has uh, uh, pays a lot of attention to personal grooming. I think I wouldn't be at all surprised if he travels with hairdressers and nail filers and, and estheticians and people to clean his face and do his hair for him all the time. He just always looks like he just stepped out of a beauty parlor. When it comes to Yeltsin, I think the fact that when he presented himself in any public situation or in front of the media, um, everyone just automatically assumed he was drunk. Without a doubt, the um, the highlights of uh, the G7 didn't come from what the leaders were wearing. What everybody was most excited about, it seemed, was the uh, CIA or the Secret Service. When we were seeing all of these really smooth, really cool guys walking around, nicely fitted black or pinstripe suits, accessorized with black gloves, dark glasses, earphones and guns, I mean, it lent to this air of mystique and intrigue, and they looked like uh, James Bond spies. I think that turned a lot of people on. So regardless of your taste in menswear, the G7 had a little bit for everyone. For Ground Zero, I'm Fred Connors in Halifax. Nothing I've seen on television has really inspired me to do anything. I like absolutely nothing about television, but uh, I watch it a lot because I'm addicted. I grew up in that kind of era.
to be what I expect. I despise television, actually. <laughs> because I don't watch it. I it's on all the time. I don't pay much attention to it. I'm really glad you guys have this service because you see, I've been having this dream. I'm on American Gladiators and I'm running around, but I'm, I'm fighting against all the women and they're like throwing me around like a rag doll and they're tossing me in the air and they're beating me on the mats and they're tying me up to things and then they're whipping me and then they're throwing hot wax and then out comes the assorted vegetable and I just don't have a clue what the hell the banana's for. End of message. A lot of those funeral uh, uh, stereotypes stem from movies. That would be the, the, the greatest uh, production of stereotypes for this industry. This casket here would sell for, with the whole funeral package, visiting and the limousines and so forth, this package here would be $11,000. As you know, deceased people, their muscles in their mouth relax and their mouth would be wide open. And uh, this instrument takes this pin and it goes in here like this and you would inject the upper gum and the lower gum with individual pins and that way you'd be able to actually close the mouth. Sort of wire it shut. Yes. Some people have a phobia of uh, they think worms will be getting them and uh, they'll have a traditional funeral followed by the actual cremation process. Here's our, our crematorium. The, uh, the body would, would be put in here. And what we do then is we wait for it to cool. Um, then we would uh, process the, uh, the cremated remains. In some instances, um, with a, a larger gentleman, we may need to, to add an additional box that may fill half full. It's, it's kind of like a fad. It's a trendy thing right now. Uh, people feel that it's um, the, uh, the almighty dollar is harder to come by. And as opposed to choosing a traditional funeral that may run from thirty-five to five or six thousand dollars, depending on this, what the family requests. What's it cost? Just a cremation. Uh, a cremation is um, cremation would be eleven $1 hundred and twenty-five dollars. That would be with the GST. let you know all the details. If you knew all of this, we'd have to shoot you. I, mean, I was trained for the Presbyterian ministry. Seven years in university, ordained. How would you like to be addressed? It's the Reverend Bob. That's the Reverend Bob. Yes. Reverend Bob, um, could you tell me what uh, religious organization that it is that you represent? The line of Judah Church of Halifax. The Presbytery took me up on trial here in Halifax and uh, told me to burn my sermons, never again preach them or get out. So I got out. Once again, would you please care to discuss how it was that you were ordained? Well, if you must know, by mail. And uh, what process did you have to go through to receive your ordination? Well, I had to send them $20. I mean, I used to go at the Norfolk Hotel. This was back in 1930. Uh, 3, 34, 35, 36, so you see I'm not young anymore, and uh, drink there a lot Friday nights. But when I got saved, I never went back. Never went back. About four years ago, 
was a margarita Monday, I believe, down at J.J. Rossi's. We had just uh, finished off our seventh tray, and a man came and sat next to me, and I could tell that he was different, some way or form, when I realized it was Jesus, and he had come to visit me. I met one man down there, a businessman, and he said, uh, I'm a homosexual. And uh, he said, I, I disagree with you coming out here in the street, taking a stand against homosexuality's hate literature. I said, you're no different a sinner than if you were a drunkard, or a robber, or a murderer, or anything else. We've instituted uh, several small compounds throughout the province. Uh, good farmland, so you can tunnel in real deep. And uh, we've uh, stocked them adequately with a lot of the, as you say, the canned goods. And, mm -hmm. uh, we're training. We've hired some XSAS members and uh, different members of the former Soviet Union that have seen the light. The government's laws are against God's word. They're casino laws. There are booze laws, the uh, abortion laws, and homosexual laws. The time has come for you to choose your side. And you've only got so long to learn how to field strip an AK, because Satan isn't going to give you that chance. But we will. The Bible says you're either a Jew or a Greek. These, these people, Ethiopia, uh, Holland, but they're, they're Gentiles. That's all God said. Then they'll get saved, they're Christians. And we're all Christians here. But the thing is, people look at television like it's the gospel. Like, television is telling me this, so it's true. Television is showing me this, so it's true. The censorship is like another stupid issue that's going to be addressed in TV. I think it's, it's just pointless. A lot of Canadian stations go out on a limb on it, and I think it's very smart. Come on in. She's doing a story on taxi drivers. <laughs> 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 we haul everybody around from normal heterosexual couples to uh, drag queens to you name it. We have them in our cabs and we don't discriminate. We pick them from point A to point B and that's a fact of life. You're a target all the time. Police are targets but they got guns. Cabbies are targets and they got nothing. Well, you have to be a people person, simple, because if you aren't, you're not going to make any, any money. Uh, you're, going, uh, you're going to be hyper all the time, and so you're going to be short with your customers, short-tempered. Um, like, it just goes with saying, you have, to, you have to basically like people. In this business, you get it all. You get people who just want to take a taxi to, just to talk. Nothing shocks me. Nothing surprises me. The only people that can uh, continue to surprise you is other drivers. We know where people live. It's just a fact of life. We take them from point A to point B. If they haven't moved, I know their address. <laughs> How do we, you know? Because we know. I'm a taxi driver. Taxi driver knows all. <laughs> the cabbie could be called on to do anything. And as far as uh, getting people to where they're going, to uh, having babies delivered, anything like that, they're capable of doing. Do you love your job? Well, now that's, uh, that's it's not a matter of love. It's a, next, a, little, a matter of a little extra money and uh, stuff there like that. But it's, it's not for love. Well, I put a lot of hours in. Uh, I'm not getting rich by no means. If you put in the hours, you, you make your living. That, that's about the size of it.